My name is Maria João Filgueira João, and uh, I am doing the uh, active evaluation of uh, this uh, project. So, meaning that we accompany every single step of this project. And it is <clears throat> a great pleasure for me to be today with you and uh, to be able to moderate uh, this uh, session, at least the first part of it, since uh, we have a chat manager that is our colleague, the project uh, uh, manager that is Goretti Silva, that will be then in the second part uh, uh, looking for the management of the questions that are in the question and answers and chat box. So, uh, as we know, this is a very important uh, thematic and it's getting more and more important because uh, we are speaking about uh, how can companies and universities work together to have more suitable um, organization of learning processes to be closer to what is needed that is good for the people that they find, uh, find jobs more easily, but it's also very good for the companies and for the, the regions and countries, since they increase the competitiveness of the companies because they fit better what they need. So um, this is what uh, is this project about. And <clears throat> we are going to have here um, some statements of uh, people that uh, have been collaborating in a certain way with uh, this project and that are going to state which was the importance of this type of models um, for the industry and for the academy and for the development of the next future. So uh, in first place, we are going to have a, a video, a recorded video of a message that will be sent to us by Giorgio Palmuccio, that is the president of the Italian National Tourist Board and is also an ambassador of this project. Uh, so please, Paolo, can we see the message of uh, Giorgio, please? Thank you very much for the invitation of the, for this event. Uh, and uh, as president of the Italian State Tourist Board, uh, I try to give you some ideas about uh, the, re the uh, Italy response uh, to uh, the COVID-19 in the tourism sector and uh, uh, the role of our uh, agency in order to provide uh, information about what is, is going to happen in the next future, to uh, think about the recovery of tourism in our country. And uh, as you know, in the last, uh, in this century, uh, we saw a, a mutation of the, uh, of the tourism all over the world, and especially in Italy from uh, elite accessibility to universal accessibility, from an inner journey to a viral experience, and from a local discovery to global desire. And uh, before COVID-19, tourism was uh, in the, is still the opportunity to enjoy a lifestyle. But now we have to change, and how to change? And we have to manage the, the change because uh, now tourists, uh, after the lockdown, uh, because of the pandemic, uh, they are worried about the uh, security. Uh, they are worried to mix uh, with the crowd. They think uh, the risk of taking and transmitting the virus is increasing. And they are looking for safety. And that's why we have... Uh, work on our attitudes and our abilities. We have to work in terms of, uh, not only in terms of technical skills, but also in terms of interper interpersonal skills, in terms of flexibility, in terms of problem solving, capacity of uh, solving all the problem we face, and uh, in terms of empathy, 
in the terms of solidarity. And in term, and when we are talking about uh, the, the change in terms of marketing, we have to work on the communication. We have to work on IT, on knowledge, on research skills. And to promote the tourism of our country, we have to work uh, with our marketing intelligence in terms of press office of digi and digital marketing media in media chat. But uh, first of all, it's important to know and uh, to, uh, to 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 uh, know the uh, the data. And uh, I remember very quick, but I remember that in 2019, Italy reached a very uh, uh, high result because uh, we had uh, more than 434 million tourism overnight in accommodation facilities, half from uh, domestic tourists and half uh, spent by foreign tourists. And uh, uh, in terms of international overnight, uh, compared to uh, uh, the other European competitors, Italy was the second destination for international overseas in Europe in 2019. Unfortunately, from uh, March, uh, February, March uh, 2020, uh, COVID uh, made uh, this uh, awful situation, and uh, in, in, uh, in terms of uh, uh, later data from the World Travel Tourism Organization, the, the, the world balance in December 20, 2020 was minus 74% of international arrivals in the world. And uh, in Europe, uh, about March, about uh, minus 71% of international arrivals. And in terms of Italy, we, are, we were positioned at minus 58% of international arrivals and related to the share of international tourism on the total equal to about half of the flows, as I told you before. That's why we are looking for the future and we are analyzing also thanks to Oxford Economics uh, the results we expect to reach uh, in the next future. And uh, after the end, uh, as I told you, of uh, uh, 2020, we think that uh, 2021 suggests a general trend of uh, less 34 percent of overnight uh, still less minus 34 before uh, the minus 34 percent and uh, with uh, about uh, minus uh, 45 percent of international overnight and minus 19 percent in terms of domestic over overnight and uh, we are working we are working uh, for the future and our vision for the next year is focused on the value growth, able to generate economic, social, and cultural sustainability. And it is really linked to the strategic uh, Italian strategic plan that uh, the three principles are sustainability, accessibility, and innovation. And uh, our objectives are in 2021, especially on the internal market, which will be the first to restart and will help the business system to get back on the market according to the new parameters. But we are also studying of the, on the nearby foreign markets because uh, for extra Europe, we must wait for the reopening of borders, of flights and markets. And our logic is the segmentation of the market, which remains oriented towards sustainable tourism and to the leisure segment, especially luxury, and the meeting industry later. Because uh, 
it's uh, and it's uh, all promotion is planning on the issue of safety as a priority asset. It is the, the main focus for tourists. And uh, I think that uh, with uh, these uh, objectives and these uh, targets, we can uh, uh, be optimistic for the future. But it's very important the relationship with education, the relationship with the uh, importance of the soft skill and not only on the uh, on the professional and technical skills. And uh, that's why, as the uh, Italian National Tourist Board, we are very interested in uh, all uh, the programs that uh, pre uh, let the people working in the tourist sector to work uh, for the future of the tourism in our country, but all over the world. Thank you very much. Uh, is it okay? Yes. Okay. <laughs> so I was uh, thanking very much for Paolo uh, to have put this video and also to Giorgio Palmucci for the important statement that he did here because it remind, reminded us that uh, the future should not be the same as the past. Uh, this pandemic should have uh, promoted a reflection if we want to go back, even if we don't know if it's possible, or if we want to take this disruption and uh, movement also to change something in the way we do things. And uh, these challenges can only be faced, be faced if really there is a strong collaboration between uh, the industry and the education system. And the other aspect that is very important that it, it was also highlighted here by Giorgio was the fact that nowadays, the soft skills are very important. I remember that uh, already four years ago, when I saw the profile that Siemens was defending for its engineers, uh, and in the industrial area, it's even more um, interesting to see this change. All the requisites that they had were soft skills because uh, they wanted only the basic technical skills because the rest they teach themselves in the plants. But soft skills, they have to bring with them because they need to work in team, they need to be able to pass the knowledge to each other and so on. So I think this was a relevant um, uh, statement. And uh, to go on uh, with these statements, I will pass the, word, the floor to Alan Arrigo, that is from Robert Arrigo and Sons from Malta, and uh, also an ambassador of this project. Please, Alan, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Maria. Um, so, um, I will be looking at uh, Malta's strategy for the tourism post-COVID. Uh, from the eyes of an econ economic operator, um, we operate within the wholesale level. So, um, at first I see it right that we explain what we do from a wholesale point of view. And then, then we'll move, I'll move on, on to how the tertiary educational institutions uh, can and should adapt to achieve, to successfully achieve this strategy at the end of the day. Uh, interestingly enough, when I embarked as an ambassador on this income tourism project, um, I obviously came in from an economic operator point of view. That was when we started around uh, two, year, two odd years ago. Um, my journey it was that I also de um, decided to read for a master's uh, degree also at the University of Malta. Since, uh, since I was convinced by, by this income project. Um, and uh, I can now be uh, 
be proud to be at at both sides of of the of the of the spectrum, so to speak. Um, so I can give uh, ex experience on that too. So I will go on the, the company overview. So as a company, Robert Arrigo has been independently since 1973, is a big player on the Maltese market and has a strong presence mainly in the European uh, segment. So we are an inbound tour operator, as I explained earlier, and employed um, eight, um, 80 employees with over 20 different nationalities. And this is where I latch on again on the soft skills that we were previously saying before, because with different cultures within the same office, although we're a very, very small island in the middle of the Mediterranean, um, we have different cultures that are with diff teams that form with different cultures. So the ability for new, new professionals in the field to be able to, to have those soft skills to also um, have the, 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 the sensitivity of cultures within, within, uh, within their remit. And which is not something uh, that is something that is needs to be learned more more often. Um, what do we provide from in the wholesale space? Mainly, we're uh, destination services in in Malta. Uh, our goal is to provide the an excellent product with a excellent quality product, um, with volume driven contracting and product management, as well as anal analytics for for the various different rates of our clients. Um, we definitely use technology and uh, we leverage a lot on the data we, we have from, the, from this technology. And this is something where I'll go into further. I'm rushing through this because I believe um, there's more to come through. Uh, sometimes images speak louder than in words. So I preferred to have um, what we do in terms of images. So we have hotel contracting where we contract directly for our principles, um, the, the, the various rates amenities that various suppliers um, have, have to offer, bus and shuttle services from the airport to, to the various, various accommodation sites and around the different sites. This is important as it's often the most overlooked portion of, uh, of, uh, business, of a travel experience. Um, tour guiding and excursions, which is the, the, the what we believe is the most pivotal part for uh, at, at uh, quality experience, because tourists want to feel uh, immersed in a culture and want to learn a new culture, um, and it is important in the interpretation of guiding as well as the quality excursions to achieve that. Uh, if we don't have that, then the then the satisfaction, the visitor satisfaction would be definitely be less and we will not therefore encourage um, repeat business. Um, and obviously the destination services in case um, things, things uh, go wrong, but the supplier side or in case uh, some people have a doubt, especially in COVID times where um, people need to have a safe environment around them. So in terms of post, post uh, COVID or rather during COVID strategy that the tourism uh, industry has in here in Malta. We, the tourism industry has, along with a, lot, a large stakeholder um, uh, vision has gone to three, to recover, rethink and revitalize. Mainly a number of key principles that have influenced the strategy, mainly from international, which has been which is obviously the pandemic has been an, a, a, a definite moment, a definite shift in, in how the industry used to operate and will operate in the future. There's obviously the new normal, a, a very popular cliche. Climate change is definitely something that needs to be considered a lot in terms of our strategy. The United Nations Sustainable Development Goals the EU Green Deal and the EU Digital Strategy and Data Strategy. All these are key when we were uh, influencing the strategy going forward for Malta. Uh, from a domestic level, this then we had to focus more on, for example, rebuilding the airline connectivity. Malta suffers insularity because it is an island in the middle of the Mediterranean. We're, um, we're not connected directly to the mainland via road or rail. So we depend a lot on the airline connectivity. Obviously, the less we're connected, the less chances that tourism will thrive. 
at the same time, we need to see how we have to protect our environment because we are only as good as our product in tourism is our socio cultural and environmental product. So if we lose any one of those, uh, we have no tourism product to sell at the end of at the end of the day. So as tourism operators, we cannot be the ones who are destroying any one of these three pillars. So it has to it is, it is important that we that we have a view in the strategy that we have protect these these three pillars. Um, the of the obvious goal of enhancing visitor satisfaction and which is something more that needs to be leveraged more and more is the harnessing of data and use of modern technologies. Now we come from a space which is mostly distribution of the product, but here what the division is, is and the strategy is focusing on is more of managing um, the, the, the future flows. And that's in, in the sense that we do not want to go back to the pre-pandemic over tourism situation. Where and, and the best way to do this is leveraging on the data and modern technologies to better manage um, this, uh, this, this problem. And lastly, but the one of the most important is the delivery of quality tourism experiences. Here, we don't mean luxury in, uh, specifically, but we mean quality tourism. So it could be a lower category of hotel, for example, but deliver it to the highest of standards within that category. So, and that is, that is very important for us. Uh, there are a number of targets. Here are some are, some are obvious. And uh, for example, as I mentioned earlier, the sustainable approach and the, how the sustainable approach to growth, and that's what leads to over tourism. So we don't want to, to suddenly be back to where we were, but to have incremental growth, especially addressing uh, seasonality and uh, grow slowly, slowly to be sustainable in, again, the pillars, the economical, economical pillar, the social cultural pillar, and the environmental pillar. Uh, the strategic target in terms, in terms of have a healthy mix of in, in tourism flows from various, from various markets. Uh, and with the, the higher quality uh, tourism experience, not necessarily luxury, that will deal with a sustainable approach to growth that will, that will deal with a higher tourism expenditure because as, as visitors would be hopefully uh, more satisfied, then there'll be more scope to choose, to choose our island and to spend more on better quality products and services. Um, again, I issued the seed of originality and obviously the, the increase in, in visitor ratio. The, the, what's here important is, is I'm going to focus in, in terms of what the, the, inst the tertiary institutions need, we feel that need to, to focus on. And the, they do a very good approach on most targets here, as, as you can see, and you might well know, but in three in particular um, that need to be maybe enhanced further. And I'm, I'm, I'm putting them in bold here mainly in the delivery of quality experiences. Um, the past pre-pandemic uh, with over tourism, we, the operators could easily fall into the trap of, of going into less quality experiences for the tourist. And that can only be enhanced by better educating the, the, pro, the profession um, and, the, and the new and, and student, the current students who will be in the profession later on. To, to enhance and, and frame their mind into quality, into, into delivery of quality experiences. Um, I also put in bold the embracing the climate-friendly travel framework that, uh, that is um, imperative for our sustainability goals. Having it already at the back of my, our minds when um, putting together travel products and tourism products, um, it will come second nature for us rather than putting it as an also ran or as, as, as an aside. Um, and thirdly, where I think this, this point should be pushed even harder is the use of technology for digitalization um, and the enhancement of data in the way we analyze um, the, oper the economic operators um, and how to use these technologies to better uh, get into the rest of the goals. So that, that is something that, that uh, 
uh, the tertiary education institutions need to adapt further um, to, to, to help the, the general op operator landscape. What is great to see, as, has, as I've mentioned before, I'm also on the other side of, from, from reading um, as a student at, in, in the masters, I've seen that a lot of research is done from the University of Malta and a lot of it is, is maybe unpublished um and uh, and there's a good very good drive in this in this 2019 2020 season that that a lot of this work has been published and disseminated to the, the professional to professionals in the field and that is great to hear because um uh, the the academia are the are the wisdom of the of the tourism professionals and and the need to pass on that wisdom onto the onto the professionals to better get a quality experience for the over for the overall tourism market in Malta. Thank you very much. I pass the word to you, Maria. Chalen, um, for your uh, interesting perspective on the future that you are foreseeing in Malta for the strategy of tourism. I think that, um, again, you are highlighting the importance of creativity, that we can follow the new tendencies, either the climate transition, but also the digital transition. Um, what I would like to reinforce also uh, is that uh, I think that uh, even the research uh, that is being done, more than uh, only academic, like it was until now, it has to be shared uh, by the industry and the academy, because we know that a long time there were two different languages. And for that reason, we could not be efficient because we could not uh, integrate what was new in the industry that they could benefit of it. And uh, uh, I think that uh, exactly that is the point in uh, models like the one we are defending in the income project. This can bring also the industry to be closer to the academy and that even the studies that are carried on can be uh, co-work and uh, can be shared that uh, they respond to all the challenges that the sector is facing for the future. And so again, we have here a very important perspective that this kind of collaborative models can bring into the sector, into the industry. Thank you, Ellen. Um, and uh, uh, I will pass the floor to Ellie Keegan, that uh, uh, is uh, um, here from Spain. And we heard in the first place when uh, the president of a national tourism board and now it's time that we hear someone that is director of a regional board. So Eli Keegan is the, direct, the managing director of Lore del Mar Tourist Board. And we are very interested to hear her perspective. Please, Elizabeth, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Maria. And thanks to the organization for inviting us. Uh, I'm glad that the local perspective is also taken into consideration in this debate. I would like to share only some images in order to be illustrative because uh, I wasn't expected to participate. So you will see that the content is in Catalan, uh, but I think it's going to be useful in order to understand uh, well, the situation where we are now. Um, we are, a, we are a destination. Well, let's start from the beginning, if that's okay. I understand, I assume that everyone is seeing my presentation. Um, uh, well, Loret de Mar is a destination that it's uh, one hour away from, from Barcelona. It's at the north uh, of, Spain, of Spain, just beside the, the French border. And we are uh, one of the main uh, destinations in, in, the, in the country. Uh, and uh, we have uh, the perception as a 
holiday and leisure destination. And we've been working as a, as a pioneer, as a leader destination uh, in a profound uh, transformation for the last uh, 10, 15 years. Uh, because it's not easy for a destination that started at the end of the 50s of the 20th century to be transformed into an actual uh, quality, uh, sustainable and digital transformation. So we have a lot of work to do. Uh, this um, presentation is only to share uh, some images regarding our destination. And we have a lot of data to, to, to share. But I'll focus uh, in the sense that we've been, as I said, in a profound uh, transformation uh, as a destination in, in Loret de Mar. And the main thing that I want, the main message that I wanted to share today, and uh, it's related to these uh, soft, soft skills that we've been all talking about uh, because governance has been the absolute key uh, for our transformation clearly. So our reconversion plan, uh, it's, um, it's made by a team and three public administrations are being part of it, the town hall, the regional Costa Brava and the whole uh, region of Catalonia, but also our private sector is part of the reconversion plan that now you'll see that it's uh, full of different investments for the last uh, five years. We have new theater, we have a, an Olympic swimming pool as we are a reference as a sports destination and uh, so many other uh, sport uh, facilities. Then mainly we cannot talk about that transformation uh, till the private sector really, really, really believed it, really, really came on board. And now uh, they're focusing in different uh, touristic segments like adults only, for example, more like urban hotels as we are a urban beach destination, as we call it. You'll see several examples of that transformation, as you know, Spanish, so well, Spain's been there in the tourism now, nowadays already for, for, for more than 60 years. So you can see several examples of that update of our uh, accommodation, for example, in several senses, all in this uh, cool and urban uh, type of, uh, of uh, hotels, for example, uh, as you can see in different photos. Then the other part of our offer uh, invested in mainly uh, family specialized uh, facilities, splash, small water parks. I don't want to be, uh, to be extended in that sense a lot. I just want to, to, to give you the sense that that was just before COVID-19. So we had a huge, um, yeah, a lot of investments in town in order to achieve that transformation and then boom, uh, COVID-19 arrived. So obviously all that we had in plan stopped. So in that sense, I wanted to share our strategy. Uh, obviously we couldn't uh, focus in that uh, infrastructure transformation. So we had to focus in the other strategies that we were obviously developing in that sense, uh, in that uh, Yoret de Mar smart destination strategy. And uh, as you all know, as experts in uh, the touristic, in the tourist management and then the tourist uh, uh, academy you know, sector and university, you know um, that we have different uh, concepts uh, in, uh, in, in the smart destination um, umbrella. And uh, I wanted to share with you a little bit of everything governance for us, as I said, it's been the absolutely key for our transformation. And it's been the absolute key uh, in this process because last year we were the first destination in Spain to present a comprehensive plan of measures. Uh, we focused obviously in, uh, the, um, in communication and media strategy in order to sell, send, sorry, uh, the messages of, uh, of uh, how our destination was prepared and was safe in, for all our markets, mainly domestic markets, as they had uh, uh, access to, to the north of Spain. So that would mainly be Spanish market and, and, and French market or Southern French market. 
So in that sense, governance has been key for the last 10 years in order to achieve that transformation, but it's been uh, absolutely uh, important uh, during this uh, pandemic year. Uh, we, our, our, our board in Lloret de Marturis board, it's uh, formed by the representatives of the, of the government, representatives of, um, of the private sector, but also representatives from the neighbors and from the uh, from the residents and neighbors of Lloret de Mar. So they all decide about our strategy and we've been doing so for the last five years already. So in that sense, we keep our people absolutely involved in the strategy, people living in, in our town. It's part of this uh, board of decisions and we keep uh, organizing several events where uh, and particip citizen participation processes where they can participate. So they are also our they are also the starting role of all our campaigns. We never work with models. We only work with people from from Lloret, and we try to work and achieve that pride uh, of uh, well that belonging to a destination which is not easy when you have uh, a touristic pressure every single year so there are always our our protagonists our our starting role and uh, they always involved in our campaign so in that sense governance we all we have every single year campaigns in order to well civic campaigns in order to to achieve the balance between uh, our visitors and the people uh, living in Lloret de Mar and their quality of life. You see with respect, we all fit in Lloret and things regarding silence and also the environment. And last year, obviously our civic campaign was be careful, be happy in our destination, obviously with all the, the measures uh, regarding COVID-19 uh in town uh, absolutely everywhere beaches private sector everywhere so in terms of uh, sustainability uh winter 2020 2021 uh, has been the winter where we had to uh, work in this uh, diagnosis uh, of uh, the sustainability in in town we are now this week starting the the uh, citizen participation process we have four sessions uh, already organized during this uh, month of April because we're fixing our uh, action plan till 2023 and related as our colleague from Malta was explaining with the uh, sustainable development objective, of course. So uh, this year we couldn't stop working, so we focused mainly in sustainability and digital transformation. That's absolutely not new between our colleagues, but uh, that's, uh, that was absolutely compulsory uh, in order to, well, we belong to the Smart Destination Association over here in Spain, and we have uh, several uh, projects and uh, um, related to, to that, arriving to our destination. Also, Big Data, uh, our Big Data platform is from Mavrian Technologies, and we keep uh, analyzing uh, everything related to our destination, social spend, holiday homes, uh, telco data with uh, Orange, the, tele, the um, phone company, uh, French phone company, also very important over here in Spain. So regarding all those uh, profiles that uh, we wanted to share this afternoon, uh, well, uh, we already said uh, that soft skills and this human to human will be there uh, and will stay in the touristic uh, uh, sector, obviously, in the touristic industry. Um, the thing is that our tourist board, we are 17 people, and we have uh, two people that have been in our tourist offices for more than 40 years. And it's very important for me to say that they have a lot, of, they bring a lot of value to our team and uh, their soft skills are absolutely necessary. And obviously we have uh, to think about, um, well, maybe bringing on board uh, a data analyst that we do not have, because we as a technicians, we try to analyze our, our own data. Obviously ethics and uh, data analyst will be very, very important. And um, 
uh, pers a transversal perspective about accessibility and sustainability, it's also to be considered uh, to bring on board in a local tourist board. But I just wanted to finish uh, sharing that we have been uh, developing the transformation digital plan of Lloret de Mar since 19th of October till uh, 25th, 25th of March. And uh, that was um, 100 professionals, four days per week, took part of this master that we did all together. And uh, we've been investing in automations, in ethics, in touchless payment, in check-ins and check-outs online, revenue, uh, social media, streaming, sales distribution. So it's been so interesting. And mainly we've been together, the whole destination, public and public, uh, private and public sector, working together this winter and uh, not being at home wait, waiting for vaccination. So we're very proud of our, uh, of our digital transformation plan. And sorry, I don't want to extend. Thank you very much uh, for, your, for your time. And that's more or less the strategy that we had in, in your head. Thank you, Maria. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Uh, I must say- Sorry, I'll yes. stop sharing one second. Okay. I must Thank say you. that Sorry. I am impressed. I think my next destination will be Loria del Mar. <laughs> because uh, uh, what I find uh, very interesting in what you said is that you are already doing uh, what uh, many are still planning to do. So, uh, and you had uh, some key messages that for me were really very important. That was first partnership. You are already uh, insisting in a participative model. So co-sharing, co-ideas, so co-responsibility. And this is uh, one step forward to really face the, the, the future because uh, you have a multi-stakeholders approach and you can face all the problems because you have always someone that is expert in something. <laughs> So this is a very good principle. So governance is a magic word that you have said. And so I find this very important. And on the other side, uh, you are already working really um, either the uh, climate transition, but not only because you are already facing the SDGs overall. And we know that the SDGs is a transversal approach that really if we succeed to reach them, we can uh, really finally have a well-being state. So this is a very good approach for the future. And on the other side, you have the digital transition, but sought in a way that should serve the other two. And this is really the secret of the success. So I think you have all the ingredients to have a very good um, uh, future uh, in this area. And of course, that. Uh, uh, since you are already working in partnership, this is a very good beginning for the academy to begin to work also on the future because it's following the process alone. So thank you very much uh, for your inspiring uh, intervention. And uh, so I will pass the floor to Jose Tomas, that is uh, also from the local level or regional level or sub-regional level, but now from the perspective of the employers, not institutional, public, but from the employers. It means that he's president of the Croatian Chamber of Commerce and Split Dalmatia County, and is also an ambassador of the project Wincam. So please, Jose, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Maria. Thank you all. Uh, it's glad to be here, but now I'm in a really uh, bad situation. I have had a job, uh, hard job to how to convince Maria to come in split instead of uh, Lore de Mar. Sorry, Elizabeth. Yeah. Okay. So in this moment, uh, I would like to say uh, that here in Croatia, especially in Split Dalmatia County, which is the second largest county in uh, whole Croatia, we are in a really bad situation regarding the COVID situation. And uh, I think that we will. Uh, 
we were talking about the tourism uh, as a before and after COVID-19, because there is a really huge, huge, huge uh, things will be changed. And the new normal, new normal will be something uh, which we will uh, thinking uh, in the future, because all these skills, what we learning before in a, in a, in academic, in, in schools, in a faculty or whatever, you know, now we are completely changing to something else. I think uh, since the Thomas, Thomas Cook or, or beginning of the, of the modern tourism, we, uh, the human populity was never uh, in such a, uh, in such a hard situation to, to see what will be uh, the next and what will our uh, tourists asking and what they will need because our industry is selling and buying the lifestyle and in this moment what kind of lifestyle we can sell or what kind of lifestyle we can buy the only thing what we are thinking now it's uh, it's definitely uh, regarding the the safety but i mean safety on the health uh, health way but on the other hand we don't have to forget uh, ab about the the all aspects what what um, what our uh, tourism are uh, giving us for example in 2019 here in croatia in lots of the country uh, lots of the cities in croatia or destinations we was facing the overcrowd of tourism but in suddenly after a few months it's a leak of uh, leak of uh, tourist leak of uh, tourist activities and everything in spite that last year 2020 we had a, about a 50% uh, compared to uh, record 2019 so it's it's still something but now with this new normal and the new things I'm not quite sure how the, how the future will be, um, uh, how we will uh, how we will work together uh, in the future. Because a few years we have this, so many seminars. We were talking about the, uh, let's say, when the when the ten uh, ten years ago uh, Airbnb just start. You know, we were thinking, oh, that's a new revolution. So some it is a new revolution, but that revolution comparing to to our revolution where are we now it's i think it's zero zero comma five percent it's it's almost nothing uh as i said before we are selling and buying the lifestyle uh and in this academical way we have to think what is the new lifestyle because these things what are happening now and in the middle of situation where are we now it's really uh it's really hard because maybe uh, not in this moment, but uh, maybe in a two or three years, we will facing the uh, uh, the facts uh, regarding the mental health of of not us, that our students, because they they had a one and a half or two years and not, not normal situation, and maybe they uh, that behavior will. Uh, they will facing on the tourists, maybe it will be kind of the PTSP for them. So it's a really, I think really, uh, really, really hard situation. And uh, that's why I say this uh, initiative, uh, how the industry and academia can work together. I think that we uh, sustainable, of course, it's no, uh, it's not, not, uh, we cannot say anything about that. Of course, it, it's important, the green and uh, digital di digitalization and everything, uh, climate change, everything is so important. But at this moment, I think uh, the mental health of our students, of our people, of our guests, of our tourists, it's uh, more important and we have to face uh, on that problem and how to solve it and how to put it in all uh, uh, in all academic institutions. That's that's my uh, my top priority worries about the about the situation because you know in a two or three years as I, as I said before maybe we will facing with some uh, huge problem which we don't see at the moment. Yeah, so I wouldn't like to 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 go further in this problem. So that's short from Croatia at the moment. I think that I was not so pessimistic, but <laughs> that's the reality as far as I see. Thank you.
Thank you very much, uh, Tomas, uh, Josef Tomas, because um, you brought uh, uh, really a very new perspective to this debate, and that is extremely important, is uh, uh, the impact of this pandemic will not only affect economy and sectors, but will affect people. And uh, people are fundamental for the development and for economy, and uh, so we need really to think how to cope with these challenges also while we need a developing economy because uh, without people we don't have economy but without economy we don't have uh, well-being for people also so it's a very uh, sensitive balance that is necessary to reach and uh, uh, I find a very good perspective. And I think that uh, this brings us to what Elizabeth said about governance. So here, the, the key word will be in the future, governance. How the different institutions together really face the challenges because uh, only together they can really solve all the different, the complexity of these problems that are arising. The mental health for one side, because of the people, but the development on the other side, and it's necessary to find the right balance point. So thank you very much for bringing this new reflection perspective that I find also very important. So last but not least, we heard already here a national perspective. We heard already two uh, perspectives of the regional, sub-regional level. And we heard also one uh, perspective from the industry itself, from Malta. And now what uh, we are going to hear is uh, from uh, Ana Maria Nogueira, that is a very dear friend of mine. We have uh, a long way together. And uh, so she is now officer at the European Parliament and has been an expert in the European Parliament in education since a long time. And she's going to give us some tips how the European perspective sees these uh, learning models that are combined with the, the industry and the academy to face exactly these new challenges and the new soft skills and how uh, this transition and these new um, aspects can be faced. So please, Ana Maria, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Maria João. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, and thank you for the invitation, uh, it's a pleasure. Before, before passing on to my presentation, I would just like to come back to the to Thomas intervention on the very last part about the health problems that we will definitely be facing, especially our children. Coming from the, um, um, from the, um, well, right now I'm not in the, in the Cultural and Education Commission anymore. I'm in the budgetary control. But all my life, as Maria Jean said, I've been working for cultural education and training. And uh, definitely one of our main worries right now is the health, um, the health states of our children after being for now almost uh, one and a half years in lockdown. Everybody, I always, always consider since the, the beginning when we wrote some. Uh, some approaches from the European, uh, European Parliament side uh, or to, to the COVID-19, it's that everybody's very worried about the achievements, about the marks, about if they pass, if they don't pass. And we are, I think we are neglecting a little bit the health uh, mental state of um, children. And I definitely think that that will be a big problem in, uh, in two or three years or, or even more. Another thing I would like to come back to, it was someone uh, in the intervention, early intervention talked about uh, that we cannot go back to the past. I, I've learned uh, from from colleagues from the maritime and uh, and ecosystems that we, as an ecosystem, ecosystems never after being affected by some um, um, environmental uh, tragedy can never go back to the, to the how they were before. They just adapt, and that's exactly what we have to do. We just adapt to the new situation. And now, after this short intervention, I would like to then start with my, my, my PowerPoint presentation, just to give you an idea of what the Parliament has been doing uh, when it comes to soft skills, uh, dual uh, learning, uh, education and training in general. 
Uh, well, as you know, the, the Parliament, uh, normally uh, we don't have uh, in partially the, the right of initiative when it comes to, to, to policies, uh, not uh, the visible and immediate one, it takes place with the Commission, but we do have some ways of, of getting to it. So um, let's, but let's see, start uh, things, um, first things first. So I think what were the, this slide we have now here, you all know about it, you know, the Lisbon Treaty, um, touched by the first time uh, the European tourism industry. But again, uh, there is always a but. And this legal support means that uh, the union can only support and coordinate the action of the member states. And I just put it here, you know, this article 195, uh, um, it's just the title because this applies as well to education and training and other policies, but right now to education and training. So the main responsibility for education and training lies with the member states. And the union can only complement, support, and coordinate the action of the member states. You know, no harmonization of the measures are possible in any member state, in, in the, from the, the commissions or the European Union's uh, side. So, but of course, there are several ways of, of uh, reaching member states because we are all different. But you know, problem, when it comes to problems and challenges, we are we have quite a common, a common uh, state. So um, that's what the union is here for, is just to, to help member states overcome those problems and those challenges. Now let's start with the European Skills Agenda, for instance. We have here um, what, just one, one of the points I have, I have uh, added, you know, increasing uh, STEAM graduates and fostering entrepreneurial and transversal skills. For transversal skills, we understand soft skills or skills for life as on, on the third point. Now you can see that is an A introduced between the STEAM. For those who are not very familiar with this economy from the, the European Union jargon, STEAM means uh, science, technologies, engineering, and math. So the A here goes for arts. And this is, uh, there's been a plea from the education uh, and training side in the parliament and uh, actually from the commission as well, to introduce arts in the curricula, because arts is definitely a way of improving, developing, enhancing soft skills. Because I, I have to, to, to tell you that when I, I read the, the income, uh, the project, I was a little bit worried when we are talking about soft skills coming up from just being developed at a higher education level. But I, I do think it's too late. Huh? It's definitely too late. We have to start earlier and the earlier the, the better. So that's why arts introduced in the early stage of the curriculum would definitely be a way of, uh, of a good start for that. Um, now, uh, the European Skills Agenda for, uh, for um, sustainability, completeness, soul fairness and resilience. What you have here, it's uh, uh, the uh, a DP resolution of February this year. So the European Parliament calls on the Commission and the Member States to give specific attention to the development of soft skills. And then you have all the soft skills where actually um, all the, the interventions I've already talked about. You can ask how strong or what is the legal uh, strength of this, of this European uh, Parliament resolutions. Well, it's not really, it doesn't have any binding effect, of course, but what it, it helps, it's, it's to have a background when you want to, to, to set up a project or you, what, when you want to call on for, for something for, gives you kind of a basis for that. So, uh, and of course then the commission can of course in, in, future, in future documents uh, take this into, into account as well. Another, another important uh, uh, document or tool that the commission or the union has, has launched is the digital action plan for 21-27. And then, of course, you have all those, those digital those digital skills that we are, that definitely your industry will need as well. Now, for the very last, it was last week, uh, we have uh, the, the parliament adopted a resolution on establishing a new strategy for sustainable tourism. That resolution that, of course, I can send you the link uh, uh, whenever you want, has, has, has been divided into four, four big uh, strands. Rebuild, refocus, strengthen, and, and resync. And I'm just, I just took uh, two or three uh, of the paragraphs of the main, uh, of the main uh, uh, ideas from that resolution that uh, I think it might be important uh, for, that is, if this works, oh no, yeah. So I, um, you have here one of the of the of the paragraphs of the of that resolution. 
when you say where the member states face common challenges and opportunities, as we said uh, just a bit ago, the crisis prevention progress towards the digital and green transition, socioeconomic and environmental sustainability, quality job creation, professional skilling and training of workers and support for SMEs. So, of course, the, uh, and that's just at the beginning of this article, we have that, you know, the union is there to support member states to overcome these problems, these challenges. And of course, now again, on new trends in tourism, you have um, all, all what, uh, what you, what the tourism will look, what you have to do into tourism, uh, not as we used to look before, as we said, but an another approach to, to tourism. Again, this is quite important for you whenever you intend to, to, to set up a project or to call, or of course, to ask for financing under, under the, the several financial uh, tools that, that we have. Again, we have here that, uh, you know, we have the Parliament call from the Commission and the European Investment Bank to establish sufficient financing for this kind of change that tourism sector is, is, over, is now going through. So we need better coordination between the EU and the local level. We, especially when it comes to access to, to financing, it's not, easy, it's not easy. I keep telling some, some of our colleagues from the Commission that Brussels is very far away. Very far away, uh, not only in geographically speaking, but in terms of acceding to the, to the information. It's really far away. So we need to, we, we need to, uh, we need governance, of course, like the, the um, that the colleague before just, just said, but we need as well the, a contact in a, a one-stop shop, let's say a contact where you can find all these new, these new tools that are coming up. And I have to tell you there are a lot coming up. You know? The difficult part is really to, to, to know what everything that is going on. Now, the, and this is exactly on that new strategy for sustainable tourism that the parliament has just uh, adopted last, last week, what we are calling to the commission. There is a single platform for the creation of digital innovation, literacy programs for the, the, for the senior executives of micro enterprises, SMEs, giving them the skills they need to optimize their wealth creating potential. So we need a lot of things are, 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 are to be done. A lot of things can be done much better if, if, first of all, if we all get together. First of all, if everybody works towards the same objective. So that is, and the commission, of course, is there, and the union is there to help, to, to help again, because we cannot have an, an harmonization uh, um, ways of doing everything, but the commission is there to make the link and to help to coordinate. Again, we need regular training and reskilling of the, the existing uh, workforce. You know, lifelong learning is uh, is definitely a, a big a big uh, a big um, way of doing it. And of course, the Commission through the has uh, developed a roadmap to upskill workers in the sector. That is what the European Parliament has has asked the Commission in this new strategy. Again. Of course, uh, uh, remember that we said at the beginning that harmonization is not definitely um, an option when it comes to, to union policies in terms of tourism and others. But of course, we need that the skills and qualifications need the kind of harmonization, especially when we are living in a, in a free movement, uh, workers' movement and knowledge uh, union. Uh, so we need, we need to, to be able to work either in, uh, in Portugal or in Malta or in Cyprus. So with the qualifications need to be uh, recognized in each of the member states. We need the, a kind of a mutual recognition that is something that the parliament has been fighting for for, for a while, but we have been finding uh, a barrier sometimes within the member states. They don't, they really don't, uh, are not very keen on having this mutual recognition. So, of course, here uh, the parliament calls on to the commission again to help member states achieve that, that level of uh, recognition. Uh, another, uh, you know that the, 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 the Commission can issue recommendations or the Council can issue uh, recommendations to the Member States. You know, recommendations, as the title says, are not binding. So Member States take it or they don't take it. Normally the Parliament has nothing to do uh, with that, has not, no, no real word, but normally they, the, the Parliament issues what we call a motion for resolution. 
meaning we normally try to add to that recommendation something that we think that is missing on that recommendation. And again, here you have a, you have a, the dual VET model that the parliament is very keen on, especially the, the employment uh, committee and as well as the education and training committee of the importance of the dual uh, VET model. That it's quite important you know, that to lead to certified skills that are relevant to employers and transferable to the labor market. But there is there is always a but. That the part I've I've told you about just just before now. It's definitely a, a very employment approach um, uh, to to vet. On the education and training part and culture, what we feel is that to really um, have a, we need a strong education foundation to have a good, uh, to, to be really good in dual, in the dual systems. It's, it's not enough to have a dual system to be trained for a job. We need to have really a very strong education foundation. And why? Because as you know, and that is, that is, there is evidence on that, uh, the, the training, the dual systems, the, or someone trained in the, in the dual, via the dual system, system, so very, very good, technically speaking. Uh, once we have a labor crisis, they are really um, very easily out of job, and it's harder for them to retrain if they don't have really a strong education foundation. Because that's definitely what gives you the basis to learn more and learn, learn always. So that's why the, the education, uh, the culture and education uh, committee in the parliament always uh, pledges, for, pledges for, for, this, for, this, for this approach to training. We have a strong education foundation that provides students with broad knowledge and basic skills in literacy, numeracy and communication, digital and soft skills, because with that basis, all the rest comes much easier. Now, just a couple of statements I found when, when, when looking, when doing a little bit research on, on uh, tourism enterprises. Um, so it's about business excellency uh, that is only achieved by a lifelong learning approach. Now, again, partnerships, as Maria João and already uh, underlined it quite well. Uh, we need as well to, to develop education opportunities for those working in tourism related industries. Tourism is changing, it's just not, you know, quitting your backpack and, uh, and just go. So we need uh, uh, opportunities. Those should fill not only the, the travelers, but of course the industry and the learners themselves. We need, uh, again, like someone already said as well, you know, this concept of lifelong learning in tourism has not really received that much attention from the academic side, probably is, 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 is really a time to do it. And of course, we, uh, what, I feel, what I feel about uh, after reading um, a lot about this is that we need more, more projects like income, that is uh, for sure. So thank you very much for your attention. And of course, I'm, um, I'm free and willing to answer any question you might, um, you might, um, you might have. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, <laughs> it was difficult now to get in. <laughs> Obrigada, Ana Maria. <laughs> it's nice to see you. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> thank you very much for this inspirational uh, speech. It means that um, there are many good news. I only hope that they will be put in place. <laughs> Sometimes this is the problem. As we know, it's a long time. <laughs> but um, anyway, we have good news. It means that uh, uh, there are a, a framework, a legal framework at European level that covers all the aspects that we have been here highlighting. And that will need the attention and even the possibility of getting some funding to put them in place. So these are good news. And so we hope that. Uh, this will really uh, be uh, a, a kickoff for the new future that we so much need. So from my side, um, I really want to thank you very much, all the speakers. I think it was a very good selection of speeches 
very uh, different and bringing the diversity of challenges that this sector is facing, but yet in the end are not so different from the challenges also other, uh, other sectors are facing. Of course, the tour tourism was much more affected, but uh, anyway, the future is there. So from my side, it was a pleasure to be moderating this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, webinar until now, because uh, uh, Goretti Silva, that is the coordinator of the project, she is managing the questions and answers. And so I will pass the floor to her to be able to put the questions that meanwhile people have been putting in the questions and answers. So from my side, thank you very much. I will be still here, but uh, Goretti, please uh, take the floor now. Thank you, Maria Joao. And again, once again, uh, thank you to all the speakers. It was very, very good and very interesting uh, presentations. And on behalf of the Income Project, also thank you for being part of this um, excellent team because you are all ambassadors of our project. And we can see if not before we were already sure of that, uh, that you are a very good ambassadors uh, considering all the contributions you have just presented here to the audience. So um, it's my pleasure now to take through the, um, the uh, question and answer a moment. So we are now open the floor to questions to our guests. Um, I will ask the audience to come forward with um, any questions they would like to see any clarifications or any further information they would like to our guests to contribute on. Um, I can see some questions already being put out in the, in the YouTube channel. Um, for instance, um, I have here, sorry. Saying, uh, Ana Rita Irinas, um, and she's asking from your perspective, she's from Budapest, and from your perspective, uh, what um, would be the most uh, important soft skills to be developed or to be worked upon by universities? So I would maybe ask this to the representatives of the, um, of the businesses of the industry, maybe starting with um, with Alan, for instance, uh, as Alan is um, representing the business sector. From the university side, as we mentioned, the soft skills are important, but more analytical skills um, to understand, especially with digitalization and the importance of data in the future. Um, it's not, not a matter of having the data now only. It's very important for the tertiary institutions to know, to teach how to analyze the data very well. Um, and that is more, uh, with the concepts that university knows how to do very well through their research. So um, it is more applying that portion, again, once they move into the, to the industry, to the working, working life, is to have it also move it to, to, to that. So those skills, those soft skills would need to remain. So from a pro operator's point of view, that is the one of the most important thing that we look out for in terms of soft skills, analyzing the data in a proper way. Okay, so Alan, you believe that at this point, and I think all contributions have reinforced the need for a smarter, let's say smarter sector, Therefore, digital skills are at the forefront of the, the skills that will provide more employability for the students and also better competitiveness for the businesses. So as, as for the, digitals, um, the digital uh, skills, I think the moment really requires for that. On the other hand, when we deliver quality experiences, and at some point, I think most of you have mentioned or at least have focused on the need for quality and for delivering quality experiences. Um, digital skills are very much important on a pre-journey or during journey or for an... Uh, for a At any point, uh, Sylvia, to be honest, because with to deliver quality experiences, you need to personalize further the, the, the experience to the traveler. So the only way to really personalize the traveler is to know your traveler very well and to know the expectation of travel very well. So the data here, again, analysis of data is really, really important. Now, how the data is, whether it is 
bots and bytes, ones or zeros, or talking to the client more often in the old fashioned way um, is, is key. But all of them are soft skills. Okay, thank you, Alan. Um, I also have um, here one question. It comes from actually the context of the income team. So we would like to consider um, to Elizabeth, considering that you are at the forefront and already being proactive, as Maria Joan said, on a multi stakeholders approach and involving like transversely uh, stakeholders within your development plan. Uh, how does the industry take part within that planning process? How do you involve the industry in terms of the planning process for the development of Lore del Mar? And how, on the other hand, the local regional board takes part in the academy, in the academic perspective for the development of tourism education? Thank you, Vareti. Um, I, I was, I'll start with the second question because it's shorter. Um, I am here today thanks to Universitat de Girona, thanks to uh, Silvia Oulet and Kim Majo. And in that sense, we have a wonderful uh, relationship with them as they are part of uh, the, the committee of the reconversion and transformation of a pioneer and mature destination in the Mediterranean, that it's cost, uh, that it's uh, Lloret de Mar. I would say Costa Brava, no, Lloret de Mar. Um, so uh, Universitat de Girona is one of our partners and it's sit, uh, it sits it in, in the table where we take all the decisions regarding the, pre, uh, pre, well, choosing the, all the priority projects in order to to well to be updated, sustainable, and to work toward quality. So in that sense, we have students from Universitat de Girona. We receive permanently uh, the groups from their European International uh, uh, Management uh, um, Master that they have. That they it's an, an example that they work uh, with uh, Slovenia and Denmark. And uh, we keep, uh, well, collaborated with Universitat de Girona, that it's from the capital of our region, every single, every single day and permanently. So that was the second question. question. And the, on, the, on the other hand, we have several ways to, con to collaborate with our private sector. Um, the most formal one is this board that we have, that it's official. Uh, and that takes decision that it's this consultative um, uh, board from uh, the Marturis board where we have the laborers, uh, the neighbors and all the representatives from the different parties in the government and the different type of companies from the private sector. But that's a formal meeting. And the reality is that we keep having them in all of our meetings, all our Zooms, we uh, have phone conversation uh, daily with the private sector in town, also with uh, all type of associations. So they are involved in all the uh, participation processes that we have, uh, the one that we're starting next week about uh, su the sustainability action plan till 2023. And uh, it's a permanent uh, collaboration and a permanent communication, which is not easy, but uh, I talk, uh, more often uh, to the president of the hoteliers that uh, from that with my brother for you to understand. <laughs> okay, thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you. And I think it's uh, visible that your efforts are very likely to have a very strong impact on the development, both on the academic and business perspective. I also have a question from from the audience, um, Carlos Fernandez, and he asks uh, whether you as a um, based on your experience of uh, working with the academia and have good examples, how to have like an, uh, an effect, a demonstration effect to develop curriculum and how to develop learning approaches. So I would, I would approach Jose with this question, if you don't mind, uh, to give all the opportunity to contribute. So Jose, would you uh, have any experiences as you are working with the Chamber of Commerce. So you might have several businesses um, examples that are good examples, uh, good practices of contribution of cooperation between academy and uh, the business 
Yeah. So can you can you repeat it? I just was on a, on the phone. Sorry. <laughs> oh, apologies. <is> it? <laughs> apologies. Um, well, um, our colleagues would like to have to understand whether there are good examples, uh, good practices that you would like to hi highlight uh, as experiences of working with the businesses and academy cooperation. Okay, exactly. Exactly. We had uh, at the right right at the moment. We have we are in a, one one huge project, EU project which is uh, really huge for us. It's about 10 million, million uh, euros. It's, it's called CECOM. CECOM, which means the collaboration together with the uh, institution, institution, private uh, stakeholders, uh, I mean, from the hosp hospitality industry and uh, with uh, our uh, tourism and catering school. So there's a, uh, that's, that's the huge project which I, we just signed uh, three months ago. And I think that will be, that's uh, that's uh, that's the the answer to your question. Okay, thank you, thank you, Jose. Um, I think income projects and the other and other projects like these are also good examples how to involve and how to bring the academy and the business together. Uh, and that was one of the questions that was also put out by the audience, uh, maybe to Anna Maria. Um, are are you familiar or being in within the European Parliament? How well, very good examples of um, incentives you have presented to us. Uh, would you like to highlight uh, from your experience um, examples of other projects and initiatives that might not be so familiar to the public and that are like wasted opportunities if we don't really spot them? Uh, hi, thank you very much. Well, uh, unfortunately, in the Parliament, I'm not aware, but what I'm aware because I worked at the Commission uh, uh, before, is that the myriad of uh, the myriad of, uh, of financial tools that we have and really they do not reach the the the, the local level sometimes and the regional level. They stay at a very very centralized level, and that is a big problem. I've always said that. Coming from, for instance, the European Social Fund, that is definitely to invest in training, education, and training, and that's really the best fund for investing in people. Uh, for 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 financial support for SMEs uh, now with the recovery and resilience fund as well that they all are available but most of the time people you know the really the, the project is to know not know about them and it's very difficult and very bureaucratic to see that and that's one of the things that the European Parliament has been going to the Commission to really set up platforms to publicize. Uh, we know that member states are responsible for for each for the European Social Fund the way they want to spend the money, but really the the, the, the Commission should kind of monitor the the way the money or the money uh, if if the, that information is reached by really the the, 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 the promoters the one who are really dealing with it, are on the ground, not really centralized but really on the ground, and that's really a big problem. It has been always a big problem with the, with the European uh, Union uh, funding. It's really who does that funding reach? Not only the big companies, it should not be the big companies or the big uh, project leaders, but really the small, local and regional things because that is where the added value is really much more visible. You know, it, it really makes an impact on, 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 on the population or on the, on the locals. So that's, uh, that's one of the, of the calls for the, for the parliament. It's not easy because member states are very, very keen of their own strategies of, of the way they, they spend or or they make their their programs for for investment, but that's that's the only thing I can say. In the Parliament, we fight hard for the money to reach every single level of, of, of governance. But that's the only thing I can say. Thank you, thank you, Anna Maria. Um, and again, coming from from an audience, um, would you consider? Uh, well, it can be to any of you. Would you consider that we need um, to approach sustainability from another perspective, or we actually need to work upon what already is established as um, sustainability measures, like for instance, the ODSs, or should we approach it in a different way so we can actually make a difference within um, higher education? If I may, though, um, I like the... I, I am a firm believer that if you measure something, um, it, human nature will uh, will somehow adapt to the measurement and will try to improve that measurement, whatever it is. So if we start at an EU level measuring sustainability goals or measuring things other than 
how many tourists visit a certain destination or how much they spend in a certain destination, uh, the operators will follow through and, uh, and, and achieve the triple bottom line at the end of the day. So I think it's, uh, there is a willingness from, from the industry to do so, but there needs to be a push in terms of measurement to, to drive it also. Thank you. Uh, any of you like to contribute to that or? I would say that sustainability, it will be achieved if we manage to have the right balance between the, the demand and offer. And, uh, and, and, the, and that we have to, now I'm more on the aspect of the traveler or of the tourist uh, as a person. We have uh, to, to start early to educate persons as tourists. Because this is, uh, that's a way of, uh, that's what I, I feel when I see some, uh, uh, some, some touristic um, approaches or some touristic uh, environment of locals, they are completely uh, not respected. I think respect is definitely a way of, of achieving uh, sustainability as well. Because sustainability has many, has many meanings. It's the financial sustainability, but it's the sustainability of, of, of the planet as well. And, and I think that is important. That educate, it, the ecological part, education part, it should have it start really very early, at really school, school level, primary, uh, secondary level. And I don't think we have that approach yet. Um, let's hope. Thank you. Thank you, Ana Maria. Um, I would like to bring another question to the audience, which is one, and I think it's uh, like, um, anybody's uh, contribution are welcome. Uh, I have also addressed this topic within one of my reflections earlier in the chat. So um, we believe that soft skills are fundamental alongside with, as being said, uh, digital or even green skills. And it is for AGIs, the academic perspective adapts to these uh, challenging times. So, but the thing is, um, educational context really requires time to introduce change because we are bounded, AGI's academic, um, the academia is bounded by legal and regulations and constraints. So how can we uh, adapt to this um, need of innovation into this need and new forms of teaching, of teaching are really required? Uh, how would you suggest that um, this disruption is done? And would you agree that we need it? Any? Difficult, difficult question to answer, to be honest. I mean, it's not an easy, uh, from uh, not being in the academia section and uh, not knowing exactly how, how it works, is hard to maneuver, uh, as to, some, to make a suggestion. Um, it, would be, it would be very boastful at, uh, thinking that I, I would be able to, to give such a suggestion. It is more something that maybe someone from the academia would be able to navigate the waters better. Uh, there's definitely the need. So from, from a support from the industry side, I am sure that in each, in each of our member countries, we will give um, the support to, to the academia if need be. But how to navigate those waters? Well, I think it's something that an, an, an academic would need to answer. Any, I think it's more of a legal context to answer. I would like, I would like to address the institutional bodies here represented. Um, how, can, how can we, as academic uh, academia, approach this um, need for innovation when our, you know, our um, our role is very limited and very much bounded by changing curricula needs years sometimes and, and, and introduce new approaches and to introduce new new contents, because tomorrow tourism is not today. So in order to introduce these fast changing uh, dynamics, how can the institutions contribute to this adaptation? And I think income projects and projects like income can do a lot because we hopefully uh, all, all your conclusions and your ideas and your, uh, your recommendations will come streamlined uh, Hopefully, in couple in 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 a couple of years. I know it, it takes long. Changing curricula, 
uh, it's really not something not easy because it takes a lot of will, it takes a lot of political will, not only political will, but um, and people try to sit uh, to be very, um, I wouldn't say lazy, maybe it's too strong a word, to change things, you know, and normally because they think it, we've always been like that, so, so it's okay. Normally I say if you always do, have been doing like that, it's probably wrong. So that's why change uh, is needed. And maybe this, we are now at the right time to change because we had this time to just sit down and think what have been doing right, what we can do uh, not that right and what we can do better. So maybe it's the time to get. And I will definitely insist on, you know, knocking at every door, you know, just knock at every door. If you have the, the basis, because, you know, you, you have what the, the union is, 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 is launching, you know, as tools, as, as recommendations, as strategies, uh, that of course they cannot impose because again we go again to the subsidiary principle so it's member states uh, uh, responsibility but if the, the union has enough projects to show that things might work some other way i think it's enough you know if you manage to to have uh, guidelines of the mekong for sustainable tourism i don't know strategy and you just you know publicize it you know uh, that i think that's definitely a way you just knock at every door you know maria joao and hi we had the former former director generally in, in Portugal that she used to say, you know, knock at every door, go door to door and say what, you know, what you can do. And something else we, uh, that she used to say, when looking at, at the legislation or regulation or recommendations, never look for what you cannot do. Because that is very easy. You just have to, to learn how to, to read what can be and that what you can do with what, even if it's not obvious. If, if it's not written there that you can do that, no, it should be there somewhere. So that's why, why you have to, to learn how to do it. You know, just you know, try, try hard. I think efforts are needed in this way. But, you know, on, 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 my, on our side in the European Parliament, you know, there's not much you can do because member states are really very keen on taking their own, their own policies and strategies and they don't like to be, to be uh, told what to do, you know, so. Thank you, MK Maria. Very, very interesting perspective. And certainly an incentive to, to go around the obstacles, not to, not, to, not to avoid them. So thank you. Uh, and finally, I think I, I would uh, wrap up uh, as no uh, further questions coming from the audience, except one like uh, um, putting up a challenge for you. Um, and it comes from a colleague also from the project, Joseph Tanti. Hi, Joe from, from Malta. Nice to read from you, <laughs> if not to see you. Um, and Joe asks uh, whether you, um, our guest speakers uh, believe that artificial intelligence and robots, uh, given we have focused on social skills and soft skills, it gives us the focus on interpersonal uh, contact and interpersonal uh, being the word for tourism experiences. Would artificial intelligence and robots replace human beings within the tourism sector or, or can they kill our jobs? No, not, not at all, <laughs> not at all. I, in that sense, I would like to give you a super small example that something that we did here in, in Lorette. Um, our tourist offices, uh, they have uh, WhatsApp, uh, but we have it since five, five years ago. So that was quite innovative then. And uh, we didn't want to, to have a chat, but because no one is on the other side. And it's true that we cannot be 24 hour uh, answering all the WhatsApp requests, but uh, our clients are so happy to see that we have a super team that they speak six, seven, eight languages and, they, they, and that they take care of them uh, and just answer any request that they have. We are now uh, um, developing a specifically chatbot because of this process that we've done in terms of digital transformation, but it's a different tool. I think uh, everything related to automation and uh, artificial intelligence, there are tools that can make our work easier, but that will not never ever change this human to human and, and these soft skills that we have sharing uh, the whole afternoon. That's uh, from my point of view, I mean, for sure. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Any contributions? Alan or Jose or? No, from my end, I think some jobs, the, the mundane jobs will be replaced, yes. Um, but the other jobs will be created. 
and the more where 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 more people skills, more soft skills will be acquired, more thinking would be acquired. Um, so I don't see it in a negative point. The the mundane tasks, yes, I would imagine that there will be the more o- automated tasks that they, where you have to click 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 done. That yes, that I see that that they can be taken over. But uh, other other people skills, soft skills. That's that we're in tourism. It's a people's business at the end of the day. It's hospitality. We cannot remove that. It's uh, other otherwise it's not tourism anymore. Well, that artificial intelligence is something you have to cannot avoid. I mean, I have to tell that more more than sixty percent of uh, the school of kids that are in school right now are being educated for jobs that do not exist yet. So that gives you a perspective. So definitely we will be, uh, there are some that will disappear, but I do agree with Ellen, others will be created. And that's why that, as I said before, the, the, the basic foundation of, uh, of education, you know, strong education foundation is fundamental for that. Otherwise we'll be uh, in trouble, let's say, we'll be in trouble. But definitely artificial intelligence will not replace human, the human touch, let's say. Although, I don't know if you know, but artificial intelligence is, intelligence is already being, uh, um, you know, used for for healing, uh, for taking care of uh, children with autism, depending on the level of autism. But they are using robots for interaction with 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 those kids. But of course, this is a very specific case because we are not really talking here about, about human touch. It's some other some other some other problems. But um, no artificial intelligence will not substitute human touch. That is that I am I am I mean not in my time anyway. So. Well, thank you, thank you all. In times when we are all confined and with very few human touch and very few human contact, that is a good message. Um, and we anticipate that we will all be enjoying much more uh, our freedom next over the next times if, if all these um, contacts allow us. So I will have now to wrap up, I, I suggest to wrap up. I have to thank once again, our guest speakers, our ambassadors for, for their participation and for their contribution, not only within this webinar, but also within the project, income project. And we will be in touch for the next uh, months because we are developing a series of activities that will involve all our, our ambassadors, all our um, stakeholders and, and partners within this project. I also thank the audience for, for uh, staying uh, throughout the webinar and participating with their questions. And again, I would challenge you to keep updated on our website. We'll be communicating and we'll be delivering further webinars and events over the next two months. So I will, we will be very glad to uh, take you as our audience over the next times. Thank you very much. It was a very profitable and enjoyable event. Thank you for, your, for all your support and contribution. Thank you for having us. Thank you for, for the invitation. Thank you very much. Have a nice afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a nice Easter.